As noted uh, early this morning, in fact, at the first panel, um, China set some very specific objectives for the Olympic Games. However, uh, China's capacity to accomplish these objectives was not entirely under its control. The construction and presentation of its, of its activities in advance and during the Olympics was mitigated by media coverage, the primary means by which cultural displays are disseminated and particularly to an international audience. And in many of today's talks, and as Dan just said, we can see how difficult it is now to separate discussion of the Olympics from discussions of the media. Uh, so today what I want to do is provide you with a narrow slice of how we might analyze media coverage. Um, I'm going to present to you an ideological analysis of the media represent representation of China that myself and my uh, co-author on a book chapter that we did, Dr. Sonia Foss, conducted prior to, and now we're looking at what happened to uh, the media coverage during the Olympic Games. Uh, we want to look at it during the Olympic Games as well to determine if our analytical framework that we created pre-Olympics is resilient across time. Uh, and you can help me determine that by the end of my talk. Uh, so, oh, is this the, uh, yeah. I think I can just use this. Uh, and so, the first thing that I want to talk about in terms of when we're doing uh, media analysis is to let you know that framing theory really informed our analysis in that with framing theory, the media invites audiences to understand the world in certain ways, but not in others. By framing information to, let, to select some aspects of a perceived reality, so to select some aspect of the Olympic Games and to make those aspects more salient. These selections by the media can promote a particular problem, definition, causal interpretation, moral evaluation, and or treatment recommendation for the item proposed. Um, hopefully, framing will provide us with an explanatory mechanism for what we think is happening with the media coverage of the games. To explore the meaning, then, of those frames, uh, we employ an ideological analysis which focuses on patterns of beliefs that determine a group's interpretation of some aspect of the world and that group's fundamental social, economic, political, or cultural interests. So in my talk today, the group whose ide ideology that I'm going to be talking about are the elite media. And I'll uh, talk to you about that in a minute. So I'm going to be talking about the, the uh, ideological frames of the New York Times and Wall Street Journal. So the data for our analysis uh, were articles concerning China's preparation for and during the Olympics that appeared in the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. We selected these newspapers because both are widely distributed national newspapers that often set the agenda for other Western media, including television, radio, blogs, and other newspapers. Both are, for the most part, highly respected. The Times, for some, is considered the principal newspaper of record in the United States. And the Wall Street Journal is viewed as a leading source of business and financial news. Lee, 2002, notes that because they provide a site and a forum for elite discourse and produce policy and intellectual discourse for elite consumption, they constitute elite media that are likely to be highly influential in the construction of an ideology concerning China. Now, I, I want to note here that ideological scholars often refer to these papers as elite media because of such influence. And I want to separate my use and scholars' use of the term elite media from that that's been most recently uh, noted in current American political discourse, so that I'm, I'm not using uh, the term in the same way that it was used in um, our recent elections. Uh, um, that there are different, and, and Dan and I talked about this last night, that uh, there are different interpretations of what the elite media is. And so uh, I'm just going to explore this a little further with you and then move on. But on, on one end of the spectrum, elite media discourse really consists of a plurality of viewpoints within a narrow range of the established order or official circle. So we have a plurality of viewpoints that are really in a narrow, kind of in a narrow range. Um, 
Or, uh, and here I quote Chomsky, uh, they're considered the lapdogs of corporate America. Uh, in our perspective, we uh, come down on the side of plurality. But again, just to let you know that there are ranges of uh, definitions of elite media. Now, an understanding of this ideology right, behind the discursive construction of China is really critically important because of the potential for the far-reaching consequences of such representation. The particular frame used can affect, for example, whether China achieved its objectives of impressing the world with the games and positioning itself as a legitimate member of the global community. Additionally, and again, we were talking about how media can affect percep perceptions, the narrative that the media constructs can affect the perceptions of China, such as the nature of outsiders' interactions with the Chinese, their view of Chinese products, their definitions of themselves vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese, and the perceptions of their relations between their own nations and China. So in our analysis then, we suggest that four ideological spaces, those of definition, equivocation, accumulation, and anticipation were constructed prior to the games. Each of these spaces allowed the media to set up a tension between two options concerning a major exigence, something the media identify as waiting to be done, a thing which is other than it should be. And each exigence remained unsolved in the space created. Uh, I'll talk about each space and then comment on uh, if it remained intact. Um, the uh, photo that I have, you might wonder why I have um, two rocks uh, balancing uh, on a ledge there. Uh, the photo that I have is meant to represent that. Uh, I didn't think this photo was going to um, Im immediately resonate. Uh, with, with, my, with my ideological spaces. But it really represents what I think occurred was that there was a balance presented um, in, in the Wall Street Journal and New York Times presentations, and that's what I want to talk about next when I discuss these ideological spaces. Uh, and that while they were teetering on having a bias, uh, a balance was really presented, and we were talking about that um, again this morning, that the media presented, a, for the most part, a balanced story. So let me talk about the spaces and how they uh, negotiated these tensions and these exigencies that needed to be addressed. So let me start with the space of definition. Um, this space focused on what Beijing and China would be like during the games and in the future. The exigence that created this space was the tension between the familiarity and comfort of the West and the uniqueness of the Chinese culture. The media narrative suggested that this problem required a balance for its readers between the desire for China to be much like the Westerners' home spaces, comfortable and not threatening, as they visited or even viewed the Olympics, and the desire to experience and appreciate what makes China unique. And so uh, in our book chapter, uh, we, we talk about how the media represented China as both Western and China as unique prior to the games. This space dissipated during the games and really kind of morphed into a space of China as host country. On the one hand, China was seen as optimistic, hopeful, creating civility, having a culture that emerged through difficult times, and was primarily uh, in these newspapers depicted through the lens of the opening ceremonies. In fact, Helen Zen, a human rights activist, said that she surprised herself and many friends when she agreed to carry the torch. She did so because she believed such engagements would help to liberalize the country. On the other hand, though, as host country, there were reports of issues um, were, that were already noted today about two girls, one song, and the sending of construction workers back to the countryside. In this new space, China as host country, China was defined not by uh, east or west, but by its production and implementation of the games. Thus, this exigence changed from one of the tension between 
uh, changed from the to a tension between construction and evaluation of China. Uh, the next space that we identified uh, was the space. Oh, let me go see if I can get back here. I guess that slide got um, moved. Was the space of equivocation? Equivocation was marked by deliberate ambiguity or evasiveness. This is the space that China's political leaders were shown to occupy, and the focus in this space is on human rights issues. The exigence created in the narrative that constructs this space is the tension between China's meeting global human rights standards and the sovereignty of Chinese officials to run China's affairs as they choose, which sometimes means exercising control over Chinese citizens and foreigners. In the space of, equi of equivocation, the tension that must be negotiated is between conformity to global requirements for practices concerning rights and the maintenance of power and sovereignty. During the Olympics, the space of equivocation in the Wall Street Journal and New York Times became a space of policy declaration with stories about the Chinese government issuing statements regarding protest regulations, journalists' access, and the detention of Tibetan protesters in Nepal. The opposite frame was illustrated by a few stories in this arena that included both President Bush and the Dalai Lama's uh, expression of their concerns about China's human rights violations. Often, though, the space of policy declaration was silent. Uh, during, during the uh, Olympic Games, uh, as such was the case with both the Chinese and American embassies not responding to the deportation of eight American protesters. Um, the, the third space that we analyzed was the space of accumulation. And in this space, uh, the primary focus was on the economic benefits that the Olympics will bring. Accumulation was depicted as an expanding space available for reaping ep economic rewards. The stakeholders who were situated in the space of accumulation were manufacturers with products to sell and marketers who create markets for those goods among the Chinese and others. The exigence that was to be negotiated in this space was between access and denial of access to new markets. This space actually evaporated during the Olympics. And uh, a few stories uh, were uh, replaced this space that mainly examined sponsors of uh, the Olympics, such as UPS, Visa, Coke, and some piggyback marketing events that occurred. Um, stories of entrepreneurial sp spirit or market expansions um, were trumped with uh, limited marketing reports, except for a story about a popular tattoo parlor and the lack of souvenirs outside the Olympic venues. So there really wasn't much coverage at all during the Olympics of the expanding markets that had preceded the games themselves. The final space that we identified in this media coverage was the space of anticipation. Uh, in this space, uh, the decision was to be made about whether China will be a legitimate and fully participating member of the global community. This space was developed largely through economic themes and was rooted in the constructed tension between growth and control or between China as a strong economic partner or, or China as an unreliable economic partner. And this was really done vis-a-vis -vis the environmental cost of, control, cost of growth as an uh, unreliable economic partner. Um, the space of anticipation really became the space of wait and see. Um, stories about the poor showing of the stock market during the games and the meeting of the uh, air quality standards uh, were reported. But we were left with an open door, actually, by the uh, elite media to see what the future will hold for these contexts so that there was no resolution that really came during the games about whether China had achieved its success as a member of the global community, even in the uh, articles that provided a summation of the games. Uh, there was no decisions that were made. Uh, a, a fifth space that we did not identify in our original analyses uh, 
is one that I call the space of the Olympic spirit. Um, and these were the stories that dominated the coverage, uh, obviously during the games. Um, these were the stories that uh, were framed by triumph of uh, gold medal wins by countries to human interest stories such as the Iraqi rowing team and actually the number of twins who were participating in the games. Um, to various competitors and countries who were winning uh, medals. These stories rarely crossed into the other spaces, which I thought was very interesting. That, again, um, to iterate uh, a few comments that other folks have made, that these stories were about the games, about the Olympics, uh, about why everyone had come to Beijing outside of the, <clears throat> excuse me, political and cultural contexts. Uh, so when we looked at this ideological analysis and tried to determine really what was going on um, with the coverage that was provided by the elite, by these two elite papers, um, we concluded that what we really had was a spatial construction of a rhetoric of assurance for the readers. That the ideological spaces that we identified uh, constituted a preferred reading of China that served an important function for the media themselves, for the consumers of the Wall Street Journal and New York Times, and for policymakers. Uh, the pre-Olympic coverage sought to reassure those who must deal with China, particularly those who have economic and political stakes, really the targeted audiences for the papers, that their investments in China would be secure and their relationships with the Chinese would be successful and productive. The spaces function to provide reassur reassurance by educating audiences about China, by avoiding a singular biased negative construction of China that we found that, interestingly, the coverage was balanced. Uh, and by assigning, uh, again, agency to Americans, these are American newspapers, assigning agency to Americans to come to those decisions rather than to the Chinese. The spaces that evolved uh, were reassuring, uh, again, in that both sides uh, of the issues were presented. During the Olympics, we found that uh, there were different frames that were presented, but also they probably led readers to draw different conclusions. But yet again, readers were left to come to their own conclusions about what was going on in China. Uh, and they were asked to come to their own conclusions in the end about China's relationship with human rights violations, about the market economy, and about the future of China outside the context of the Olympics. And again, those last three issues that I mentioned, um, the spotlight on those issues really dimmed during the Olympics for the elite media. Uh, again, the athletes and the games and the competition really prevailed. Um, I think we might find uh, a different story if we looked at other media venues, um, if we looked at the blogosphere, um, if we looked at television coverage. Uh, Marsha McLuhan said that the medium is the message. And certainly here, the medium of the newspaper provided a different message than if we took our analysis to other media. Um, I'd like to kind of just close with, with one comment about policy. Um, agenda setting theory notes that policymakers can drive the media agenda or that the media can set the policy agenda. Um, we probably saw some mutual influence in the relationship between the media uh, agenda and the policy agenda during the Olympics. And, and I was thinking about this when uh, we were talking about the fact that China did not have uh, really an established messaging system developed for human rights violations. Um, it was really the media agenda, uh, particularly the internet and what was going on in the media, that started to develop that policy agenda uh, and that China's developing now. So we have this, this relationship between media and policy, I believe, that were interactive uh, during the games. Thank you very much.